You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors. All right, everybody. That music means it is Wednesday, Education Wednesday. Yes, it is time once again for Options Boot Camp, the premier options educational program. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the TAG OptionsInsider.com, as well as from the network upon which so many of you are mainlining these days. Hope you're having a great trading week out there. Remember, if you're just listening to Boot Camp, man, are you missing out? Nearly a dozen other programs waiting for you over there on the old networks. Maybe you like crypto. We have the crypto rundown. Maybe you like volatility. We have volatility views. Maybe, of course, you like a little bit more what's trading, unusual activity. We have, of course, the option block. A little bit going on with the advisors and education, asset managers. Also touch on crypto there as well, which is interesting. We have the advisors option, futures options, this week in futures options. You name it. There's probably a show here on the network that touches on that aspect of the options market in some capacity. So wherever you're getting options boot camp, and it's available just about everywhere under the sun these days, make sure you're upgrading to the full network. Of course, if you like what you hear, this show, anything else we do, throw a like, a star, a comment. We've been doing this show for, man, over a decade, Dan and I. The whole network this January, 17 years. It's crazy, crazy to say that out loud. So we've been doing it for a while. We have a lot of great reviews going back decades, but hey, the algorithms like the new stuff. They tend to favor that new stuff. So if you like what you hear, throw a like, a star, a comment, just like this week's Five-star review comes from Solo King. I like that handle. He says, thanks so much for this show and for everything you do. You've made me a better trader. Well, thank you for that. Thanks for taking the time, Solo King and everyone else out there, to rate and review. We do love Glad to see you're enjoying the show and getting a lot of value of it. That's why we do it here at the end of the day. Of course, if you want even more in your lives, only one place to go, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. You get even more unusual activity, a whole show of it called Options Oddities. You, of course, also get... A little fun show we call Pro Q and A. Just had Scott Nations in that yesterday, tackling all of your great options and volatility and you name it questions, as well as live streams. You can heckle Dan live here on the show and every other show that we do here on the network live. And of course, great giveaways like the Pro Trading Crate. Got to give that away for the month of January now. So stay tuned for that. All sorts of fun. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. The place to go for all that. As we go around the horn, see who's joining us on the old options boot camp program today. First, let's go out to the southern options mecca known as Frankfurt. <laughs> we are joined once again by the black-hatted one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring. Mr. P, welcome back to Options Boot Camp. How are you doing on this Education Wednesday, sir? Hey, Mark, how are you? It's good to be back. And uh, yeah, we got uh, a, a lot hailing from the uh, the southern headquarters here, the, the Mecca. Oh, so you're saying I wasn't just joking. It truly is the yeah. southern options Mecca because we are also joined today on the program by a first timer on Options Boot Camp and indeed on the network. She is Jenny Andrews. She is the other half. Of the Liz and Jenny show, we had Liz on the show back in November, November 15th, I do believe. So it's now we have the other half, Jenny Andrews, joining us here for the first time. Jenny, welcome to the Options Bootcamp program and indeed to the Options Insider Radio Network. 
Thank you so much, Mark and Dan, for having me. This is uh, I'm actually thrilled to be here because it's like a blast from the past because I spent many years uh, with Dan in the same pit down on the oh, trading floor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned your, your trading background. Like we said, this is your first time joining us on the network. So give our listeners a little bit of an overview of your background in the world of options. What pits, what products did you trade? And then uh, what it is that you do over there at Tasty? Okay, so um, I have a degree in economics, but I decided to go into trading instead. So, And uh, I was down at the CBOE for about seven or eight years until I had my first child. And I spent most of that time in the Bristol-Myers BP crowd with Dan. Uh, but back then, it was really the corn and glass crowd. That was the, that was the hot stock back then. Dan, do you remember? Oh, yeah, 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 it was, wasn't it? Right. Corn and glass. That was the big one. That's what everyone was coming for. Uh, but it's not that big anymore, but it was hot back then. <laughs> the hot thing. Um, yeah. And uh, after I left the floor, I stayed home with my kids for a few years, maybe a close to a decade. And uh, then when Tasty Trade started, I, I, Liz and I started a show over there and I've been there since 2011. So it's been great. Been fun. You didn't spend any time in Intel, did you? Uh, no, I don't. Th- you know, I, I briefly worked for Timber Hill, which is Interactive Brokers, and uh, I bounced around when I worked for them. But once I started trading on my own, I just stayed in the Bristol Myers pit. I thought we had someone with a similar name in the Intel crowd, but you know, it's it's been I might, a while. I could have, <laughs> I might have been in there. I might have been in the Intel crowd briefly. Yeah, it was um, a crazy time but, in that time. Yes, a lot of people coming and going. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> um, but so it's kind of nice coming on the show and. And getting to um, talk to you and Dan, because uh, I know I work with a lot of people from the trading floor, but Tom and Tony, those guys were mostly in the uh, in the OEX. You know, they're not the equity guys <laughs> like we are. All right. Let's get the ball rolling a little bit of the old options drills. Well, in Mook, time for our favorite pastime, option drills. We're going to take the strategies learned during the show and teach you how they can be employed to achieve a specific objective. Do you hear me? Yes, sir! All right, everybody, welcome to Options Drills, a portion of the show where we do just that. We take an options concept and expand on it in a little bit more detail and explain how you can utilize it in your own portfolios and today's topic was prompted by a listener question dan and i were discussing on the show last week a listener right in i believe the name was conrad asking about call skew in certain names and it's a topic that's been broached by others recently so it seems like it might be a good time to do a bit of a refresher on trading options and what we traditionally would call a, a high call skew or just maybe a high skew environment depending on how uh, you look at it out there now We've talked about this in the past, did a lot of this back in 2021 when it seemed like everything was bid up to the upside and all anyone could do was buy out of the money upside calls. Not quite in that same environment right now. It's not quite as ubiquitous as it was in 2021, but there certainly are pockets of it out there. So definitely, I think, worth revisiting here on the show right now. Let's start. And a lot of new listeners come into the show all the time. No idea what the heck we're talking about. Again, if you're not familiar with the terms like skew and others, Go back into the archives. We touched on it many times. We spent a lot more time explaining it in more detail there. But quite simply, what we're talking about right now is a high call skew environment. What does that mean? Of course, you have the at the money call, which is traditionally your 50 delta call, right? And then, of course, you have your out of the money calls. And the way skew is usually measured, there's different ways to do it. But most people tend to look at the 25 delta call and the 25 delta put. So that 25 delta call, the level of implied volatility How does it stack up versus the at the money? And how does that compare, of course, to the historical levels that both of those have had? And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a high call skew environment. Looking at that 25 delta call, that out of the money call, is it at a much higher level of implied volatility versus the at the money compared to what it has been in the past? And there's a lot of different ways you can analyze this. A lot of brokerage platforms will do this for you. A lot of great platforms, like, of course, we have uh, you know Henry and Sibo and the folks at Trade Alert on our Option Block show. I use Trade Alert for a lot of this kind of scannings. They do a lot of great breaking down of the skew based on where they are as a percentile over the course of the past year. So a lot of platforms will do it for you in a lot of different ways. You can even configure some scans 
for a high out of the money call skew. So there's a lot of different ways you can look for this, but that's what we mean when we're talking about a high call skew environment. Let's go around the horn, get some thoughts before we dive into some specifics. Jenny, as our guest, we'll start with you. Obviously, everyone thinks of 2021 when they think of high call skew environments, but there's other pockets of it throughout time, including right now. So when I say to you, you know, trading options in a high call skew environment, what springs to mind? So, you know, you have those stocks that have been having those crazy runs, you know, NVIDIA, AMD, or you get those that are just on fire and everyone wants to jump on and be part of it. And those tend to have a call skew. Um, I feel like those situations are really difficult to trade unless you're just selling naked calls, which is kind of scary in those situations. Um, because when you have such a call skew, call spreads trade cheap, so you don't want to sell them. Um, and it's hard to sell puts when something's at one of, you know, towards its highest, highest price. Uh, I prefer to find price products that are at the lower end of the range and have a high call skew and just sell puts in those products. Like right now, Tesla or Boeing or Disney, those seem to be lower end of the range, but they have a high, they have a call skew. Um, and I'll usually stay away from the calls, just sell puts. That's oh. my preference <laughs> because I think it's hard to jump into those products that have been running up. Like, what do you do? You know, what do you guys do in that situation? It very much is. It's, it's the opposite of catching a fall. And I was catching an exploding bullet to the upside, right? How, how do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of challenges. Dan, same question for you, sir. When I ask you that, when I say, when I say the words high call and skew environment, what leaps to mind for you, sir? I kind of do this uh, dance somewhere between considering getting into buying calls. But, you know, like you guys just said, that's really tough. But then I look for opportunities where it forms a resistance level and then sell some really, really short term call credit spreads. And you got to be really careful doing that. There's got to be established resistance, um, you know, not at an all time high. You won't want to do that. And um, I will keep it very, very short term because you're still kind of fighting the tape a little bit. So you don't want to have like a like a two week trade on because that resistance can get broken pretty easily. But, you know, like the, the high, the high call volatility is an interesting opportunity. It is indeed. So let's break down some ways you can take advantage of the opportunity. Again, obviously there's a lot of different moving parts with this. And a lot of this is highly subjective as Dan and Jenny just pointed out. Uh, but in general, when you're talking about a high call skew environment, one of the ways you typically want to take advantage of it is two strategies that allow you to sell that far out of the money call skew allow you to capture some of that historically high ratio you're seeing between the far out of the money call and the at the money call what are different ways you can do that some basic ways uh, probably the easiest way most people are familiar with is of course your very basic covered call now this would of course require you to have more faith in the underlying because you have to hold the underlying in this environment. But if you do, let's say already have the underlying, maybe in your back pocket, you're riding it up and now you've decided, Hey, you know, there's a level here at which I don't mind getting out of this stock. And you see that you're getting a level of premium for a covered call on that strike. Maybe somewhere in that out of the money call range could be five, 10 could be more, could be farther out of the money, depending on your preference. That's the nice thing about a high call ski. You could sell a farther out of the money covered call and still get a decent amount of premium for it. So you're giving yourself a lot more room to run on the upside. If you decide to clip it, to sell that covered call a little bit closer to the fire, then you're going to get a lot more juice for it as a result. So for covered call traders, this type of environment is fantastic. It really gives you a lot of, a lot of juice to squeeze out there, which is great. And again, if you've already had a run or if you have some already some faith in that underlying and you don't mind letting it go at this certain level this is an ideal setup for you uh the other way to go about it is of course if you maybe you don't want to buy the stock but you like maybe a little bit more upside action to come from this name and you like being able to take advantage of that at a discounted price that's where things like long vertical spreads for calls can come in right you're buying the at the money that's probably going to be a little bit inflated because vol is probably going to be up across the board in this name but you know you're going to turn around and sell that out of the money call against it. And again, you're going to be able to buy that vertical for a much cheaper level than you would traditionally have been able to in the past because that out of the money call is now much more expensive from an implied volatility perspective. So maybe that vertical would normally in that environment be trading for, let's say, $2, and maybe you could buy it now for buck fifty, a buck twenty-five, something like that. So 
Uh, discounts on verticals. You can get in on action at a much lower outlay, dramatically reduce your risk, put on that position. That's also a very attractive way. Uh, some people like to go the ratio vertical route of you know buying one at the money, selling two. Dan and I have talked many times about being net short units to the upside, especially in a name like this. We've all seen GameStop and others explode to the upside. So we all know there is risk to the upside. So you probably don't want to go that route, naked net short units to the upside. If you're going to do that, you're probably better off going the, the debit or the long call fly route. So you have some protection to the upside. So of course, call fly listeners, you're going to buy something around the at the money vertical, maybe a little bit in the money, maybe slightly out of the money, depending on how you like to set up your flies and then turn around and sell two of the farther out of the money calls. And now that's, of course, where you're going to start really taking advantage of that high call skew. And then because you don't want to get all of your account wiped out, <laughs> you're going to buy another farther out of the money option against that. Now you're paying a little bit for that, obviously, farther out of the money option. So you're going to have to probably adjust, probably do a broken wing fly to really make them line up in the most judicious fashion. But those are just some very basic ways you could take advantage of it. Now, Jenny, you said this type of environment, you like to avoid it entirely and just go uh, to the puts and put spread. So walk our listeners through some ways you like to approach this. Okay, so I was caught in the GameStop run and uh, I learned my lesson. Um, and I, I wasn't selling naked calls in GameStop, but I was selling naked calls in XRT, the retail ETF, with which that ran up like crazy when uh, GameStop was running up. So after being in that, and then, and again, if you're selling a spread, if you think, well, I'm going to sell a call spread because, uh, because I want to define my risk. Well, those call spreads are just too cheap to sell. So unless like Dan was saying, you go very short term and you're looking to capture your credit very quickly. Um, I just do the flip side and, 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 you know, take advantage of the high volatility, but we'll sell puts, but usually not on these products that are running up like crazy. I'll find products that have had a drop down, but they, they have a call skew and I'll sell puts in those. Like right now, uh, you know, I'd be looking at Disney or Boeing or Tesla or products like that that have fallen, but they have a call skew. I'll take advantage of that higher volatility and still sell puts kind of stay away from the naked calls. I if you I don't know if Liz mentioned it, but we've both been burned on naked calls many times. We tend to stay away from them. If there's one mantra we have on this show, it's avoid naked short units, especially to the upside, right? That's just, uh, right. That, that was drilled into my head in my old market making days and I never really got away from it. And obviously if people needed a refresher, 2021 is about as good as one as any <laughs> in terms of just right. you, you weren't even short GameStop. You know, you still can get your face ripped off and just adjacent names. So, yes, uh, the risk is there. Uh, Mr. Dan, same question for you. You brought up an interesting suggestion. You brought up the short call vertical or the credit call vertical, which is actually one of the ones I have on my do not trade list in this environment, because for the reason Jenny just said, usually you're selling them for a pittance for not much at all, because that out of the money call is so big. So why do you like short call verticals in this environment? And how else do you like to approach the high call skew environment, sir? Yeah. And, you know, it depends on a few scenarios too. I mean, if you're selling an at the money call, and then buying a higher volatility out of the money call. I'm I, I'm not necessarily a big fan of that, but when, you know, when you get, I mean, typically what you get is the volatility sneer where the volatility goes just a teeny bit lower with each successfully higher call strike. But when I'm thinking about a lot of these stocks that, that uh, the volatility gets bid in the calls, I think where the volatility just gets a teeny bit successively higher with each higher strike. So not getting into that, um, you know, negative volatility skew very much. I, I definitely would avoid that. But um, yeah, I mean, the only the only time I like it is if the volatilities aren't that disparate between the two. And I can just get an overall bigger credit than I otherwise wanted to, you know, otherwise would have gotten. And, um, you know, like I said, I definitely always keep them very short term because because you're fighting the tape. You're just trying to steal a little money out of there by having a trade on for a couple of days. All right. Let's look at the flip side of that uh, really quickly. And we'll get to obviously some of your questions as well. 
Obviously, in a high call skew environment, there are things you want to avoid, and it's effectively everything that's the flip side of what we were just talking about. We were just talking about strategies that take advantage of selling that far out of the money call, taking advantage of that high call skew. Anything that makes you pay up to get it, you probably want to avoid. Obviously, we talked about covered calls. The flip side of that would just be straight buying a far out of the money call. Probably want to avoid that in this environment. Uh, Also, what Dan was just talking about, I mean, outside of maybe some very, very quick short-term scenarios, you definitely want to stay away from uh, the credit call spreads, the credit call verticals, selling the the at-the-money or somewhere around the the at-the-money volatility and buying farther out of the money vol because, again, now you're selling that call spread, as Jenny pointed out, for a very low level. It's not really worth doing. So uh, stay away from those in general. Any sort of ratio spreads that involve selling near at the money and buying farther out of the money on a ratio, you want to avoid that. So the reverse ratio is what we are just talking about. Credit call flies where you're selling at the money vol and buying too farther out of the money vol. You probably want to avoid those in that scenario as well, unless you can really break the wings and really structure it so that you're selling at the money, buying too out of the money, and selling some even further out of the money, and somehow because the call skew is so wonky, maybe that further out of the money call will will help pay for everything. But outside of that aberrant scenario, you probably want to avoid uh, those kind of credit call flies as well. Uh, Jenny, any final thoughts on do's and don'ts or just takeaways for our listeners if they encounter a name with a high call skew? Well, I, you know, we get questions all the time um, on on some of these products because many people see if they've had such a run up and these are usually the products with these big call skews, they'll want to fade the move. And so we'll suggest, you know, maybe looking at buying a put diagonal or doing, uh, or doing something like that to, if you're, if you're bearish and you're wanting to fade the move, instead of using those calls, use the puts and, and maybe buy a longer term, you know, like an April 50 Delta put and sell, uh, shorter term March 25 Delta put and put on some kind of long put diagonal. If you're trying to fade this, this run up the stacks having, that might be a better way than other than, you know, instead of using those calls. There you go. Mr. Dan, the final word to you, sir. What should people take away when they're thinking about trading options in a high call skew environment, sir? Well, it kind of goes back to fundamentals, I think. Whenever you're trading options, you're trading volatility. And the way I look at it, and I think the way a lot of mark makers uh, would look at it, is the the at-the-money volatility is like the volatility, and then the skew is, is, you know, skewed, right? Um, So when we're looking for opportunities, whether to buy or sell options, we need to pay attention to whether volatility is cheap or expensive. And it's, it's abnormal for, in most stocks, it's abnormal for the calls to have a higher implied volatility than the at the money. So I think it's just important to remain open-minded if you're doing covered calls, that could be a gift for you. Um, and, and just consider, Hey, what do I do with this overpriced volatility? And you just start, asking yourself that question and that's going to help guide whatever strategies that you would otherwise trade and and construct them in a smarter way for that that overpriced call scenario remaining open-minded good advice for options trading also good advice for us as we head on into the mail call mail call time to look at questions submitted by our listeners Ah, so festive here on Options Bootcamp. It's always Flag Day. It's always 4th of July, even in the depths of winter here in Chicago, whenever we do the show. It's always fun. And Jenny, they didn't prepare you, so I won't make you come with a question of the week for our audience. We'll save that for another time. (laughs) Instead, I'll make Dan do the heavy lifting this week. Mr. Dan, the folks are waiting with bated breath. What is your market taker question of the week? Well, you know what? This is actually a really funny coincidence because <laughs> I I was asked a question in our chat room like Monday or something. And <laughs> the question, Jenny, you're going to love this. <laughs> the question was, what is uh, somebody was talking about a zebra spread? <laughs> and That's what we had. Me, that guy just asked us that. 
on the show. Oh, Remember, no, he wrote that, in. Oh, that was on the show. He wrote in with the zebra. Yeah, that was his suggestion, and we had no oh, idea yeah, what the hell he funny. was talking about. Yes, <laughs> I, I I knew somebody asked me recently. Okay, yeah, so it was on the show last week, uh, and I was like, I don't know. And then I was in my uh, my chat room, and one of my uh, you know my good student traders was like. Oh, that's from the Liz and Jenny show. And I was like, oh my God, that's hilarious. I'm going to talk to her next week. So I I think I can bounce the question to Jenny if that's cool. Oh, so Jenny, you have you guys have another animal named spread that we're not aware of here. <laughs> okay, I mean, so when, when Liz was I on last to... time, she she walked us through the Jade Lizard. Dan and I weren't really familiar with it. We as he mentioned, we had a listener reach out to us last week mentioning the zebra we had no idea what the heck he was talking about <laughs> so i'm glad you're here okay. to set us straight i do want to say like we did not come up with these ridiculous names um <laughs> the, so when we created the jade lizard strategy my name is jenny her name is liz our, we put it in our viewers hands we said do you got you name it you know we'll put it on twitter and the winner you know we'll announce the winner so we had so someone was combining J and L and they came up with the J lizard. That was the winning name. So it's not our fault. And the zebra is uh, it, that got its name because it's a zero extrinsic back ratio. And so when you put it, you just zero extrinsic back ratio, it ends up almost spelling out zebra oh. that, and that just became the way we would refer to it. And uh, I know it sounds insane but um it's very it's just quite simply replicate it just replicates 100 shares of stock using options and having no theta so you have no theta decay you're not giving up any extrinsic value so you buy 270 delta if you want to uh, if you want to replicate 100 long shares of stock you use the calls and you buy 270 delta calls and sell 150 delta call so you're you're getting 90 deltas but you're completely washing extrinsic value. And then on the put side, you would do the opposite. If you want to have 100 short shares of stock, you would buy 270 delta puts and sell 150 delta put. It would give you 90 short deltas. So just it acts like stock, but it's much, much uh, less capital. And it will make money one for one, but your risk is, is capped. You don't have the unlimited risk. Interesting. Interesting. So now I know the next time someone sends us in a weird anthropomorphic uh, spread name i'll know to go to you guys first oh it must be one of another this and is the crazy plug, hippo if you plug it in <laughs> if you plug it in and look at the analysis it is just a, a back ratio that's why we call mm. it the zero extrinsic back ratio i like it i like it. oh there you go dan see jam we were just joking about this last week see everything comes full circle here um that we were we were joking about jade lizard before that and then liz came on and uh, she taught it to all of our listeners and then just randomly we get the zebra and now here we are the options world is very is very fickle at the end of the day. I like it. I like it. All right. So good one, Mr. Dan. I like that. All right. Let's keep on rolling. Let's go out to some of our own questions, our poll questions. You guys always tackle here, our listener questions of the week. Uh, we had a couple of fun ones last week. We did a quick uh, flash poll during, I believe it was our option block show last week, uh, because we were debating this on the show. We asked you quite simply, what do you think is leading the dance in the market right now, gave you four, oh, three in the infamous other, the Fed, earnings, election vol, or other, and exactly half of you, 50% said it was the Fed, 40% going for earnings, only 10% saying election. No, no chime-ins for other. I usually like, that's how we got the zebra last week. Someone wrote in for other. So I always love and look forward to the others because you folks always write in cool stuff, but uh, no others on that one. Our actual question of the week last week was, uh, you know, along the lines of volatility, we said, hey, VIX has been sub-15 for most of the time since last November, and if that continues going forward, how will that level of vol impact your options trading? We gave you a bunch of different choices. You're saying you're going to do less credit or income trades. You're going to do flip it around. You're going to buy more. You're going to do more debit, long premium trades. Other, something else you want to write in that's funky, or you have no impact or immune to VIX. I think that's where someone wrote in the zebra on this one. Uh, and what ended up taking it was 35% of you saying it has no impact or you're just immune to VIX, so you don't really care where the vol level is. And a lot of you wrote in saying you trade a lot of high contango type strategies using a lot of these vol ETPs. So the relative level of vol doesn't matter as much as the overall shape of the futures curve, the contango. So that makes some sense. That is a scenario. I wouldn't say it's immune to VIX, but it's not quite as dependent on it. And then 30% uh, of you saying you're, you're going to buy more premium, more debit long premium. 20% uh, saying you're going to go the other way, sell less. 
less credit or income trades, and then 15% went with the infamous other. All right, fast forward to this week. Our live question of the week right now, listeners, you guys can play along, as always, at Options over there on the Twitter. And we said, our earnings season going strong right now. Big reports coming out from Microsoft, Apple, Meta, and Amazon last week. And more are coming out to move markets and drive volatility, which raises the question, how important is earnings season to your options trading? Very important, somewhat important. Um, a little, I guess, or not at all. Mr. Dan, we'll start with you, sir. If you have any thoughts on what else our audience voted on, I think the Fed is driving the market. They, a lot of them, 35%, say they don't care where the hell VIX is for their options trading. And then B, what do you think they're voting for right now in terms of how important earnings season is to their options trading? Oh, well, I mean, as far as me, I I say it's very important. And I say that because, like, I put out this daily video, and a couple of days ago, the video was the market is watching the wrong thing. Everybody is focused on the Fed, but it turns out almost not mattering because when we get bad news, the market goes up. And when we get good news, the market goes up. Um, and like we already know what the path of the Fed is, but some people sort of uh, try to get ahead of it and be overly optimistic. But what really ends up mattering is earnings, is like the PE ratio of stocks and or the market itself, especially the market itself, I would say. And when earnings are better than they were last quarter, like they are this quarter, that raises the P in the PE ratio, or no, that raises the uh, the E in the PE ratio. And so what that ends up meaning is that the P ratio ends up being smaller and there's more room for the stock to, stocks to run up. So I know that's a very long-winded answer, uh, but the answer is, is very important because when we're selecting which strategies to trade, we need to know what the implied volatility is. So you're going to say very important. You think our audience is there as well? I think they're going to go somewhat important. All right. Oh, there you go. Interesting. All right, Jenny, same question for you. If you have thoughts on these other polls I laid down about our audience saying they're immune to VIX and thinking the Fed is leading the dance, have at it. And then uh, coming into this week, our actual question of the week this week, uh, we're asking our audience, how important is earnings season to their options trading? If you have your own vote, have at it. And then B, more importantly, where do you think our audience is falling? So I think the audience is going to say somewhat important, and I think I would say the same. Um, I mean, we've had mixed, we've had, we have had some mixed earnings, but we wouldn't be at the levels we're at without some of the big ones, right? Like NASDAQ, NVIDIA, a lot of those really drove up the NASDAQ. And so you know, we're at levels we haven't seen before, but now that the earnings are over, is it going to settle down? Um I, I think so, it, but with this low VIX, what do you do? Uh, it was interesting to hear some of the people didn't really care about the low VIX and they were going to just trade anyway. For me, I try to you know, still find products that have a higher vol or, or search for my like trading universe is smaller when the VIX is so low. I'm looking for things that do have high vol to trade. I'm not just like blindly trading anything because if it has a low vol, I'd rather not trade it. Um, but, uh, but they are some great questions. And I think earnings have been tough for some people because we have had some outlier moves. And so a lot of our viewers have said, you know, oh, I've had it with earnings. Um, it, we've had too many outlier moves. I'm not going to do them anymore, but they have affected the market and, and the, and the up move we've had. So it does affect the market. I think the viewers will say somewhat important. I don't know how many of your viewers are active earnings traders. Yeah, let's get into it. Obviously, it's hard sometimes to get caught on the wrong end of an 80-handle move in, in meta. That could leave a mark. So I could see why some, right, of, your, right. some of your listeners are, would, be, uh, would not be a fan. We tend to mostly counsel on avoiding it whenever possible, but sometimes it's unavoidable. You want to trade around. I know Dan does a lot of, you know, obviously earnings trading with a lot of his systems, so it is very subjective. I know for a lot of our listeners, they tend to mostly trade around it. 
And uh, that looks like that's backed up by uh, the data here right now. 58.3% saying it's somewhat important to you right now. So it's not, not the biggest driver, but it's something you pay attention to. Obviously, you can't ignore it if you're trading a product and it has earnings popping off after the bell. You need to be cognizant of that. So a 58.3, that's probably maybe a little higher than I thought, but I thought somewhat important would be taking it. Then we have pretty much a tie for number two between very important and um a little, I guess, with both around 17%. And then a little over 8% saying not at all. Uh, you got a couple days left. That is our question of the week. So that will obviously expire at the end of the week. Get over there at options. Make your voice heard out there. Listen, let's keep rolling. Let's go out to this question here from JJL. Sent it in last week. Didn't have a chance to get to it on the show. He says, should I apply the lesson about not selling covered calls from your great covered call debate episode uh, to short puts as well since they are... The same thing. Interesting question. You know, before we get there, Jenny, I'm curious uh, for your take on covered calls right now in general. You know, we've been talking about them on our show of late. In fact, we had a, a good episode a few months back with Dan and one of our other guests, Mr. Matthew Moratz. We're in a heated debate, locking horns over whether it was a good time to do covered calls now or not so much. Dan was on the pro side. Matt was on the con side. And I'm curious... Before we even answer the question, where do you fall right now on covered calls? Are you a fan? Are you not a fan? You find you're doing them less than you maybe you were in the past? What are your thoughts? So I don't – honestly, right now, I have no covered calls on, and I probably have 60 positions at least, but no covered calls. Uh, but, you know, on the flip side of that, I have plenty of at-the-money puts, which, you know, you can look at it as a kind of a synthetic covered call if, if it were slightly in the money put. Um, but just for capital purposes, you know, I trade on margin, puts use way less margin than a stock position. But um, as far as getting into a bullish position now, I'm careful at what I select. Like I'm always looking for lower price products or products at the bottom of the range, something that has a higher, higher vol. Um, and so I have a handful of products that I have my bullish positions on it, but it's not just anything and it's nothing that near the top of its range. So it sounds like you are okay with some short puts in this environment, even though you're kind of keeping your powder dry on the upside, on the covered call side, Jenny. Is that a fair assessment? Right, right. And, you know, it's in, so lots of people ha like to have stock and, and keep their stock and keep selling calls against them because they don't want to lose their stock. I understand, I understand that. But when you are when you start out as a trader and you come from the trading floor and you just are an options trader, uh, you know, there's a lot more capital efficient to just uh, trade options. When those puts get put to you, do you turn around and wheel out of the stock? What is your what is your next step after that? I'm curious. So yeah, well, we call that the wheel of fortune. If we're selling puts and and we end up getting put the stock, then I'll usually just keep keep selling calls against that until at some point it runs through the calls and gets taken away. Because at some point, if it runs through the calls and there's nothing left in the calls, I'm never going to pay to roll my call out and up. I'll never pay to roll a call. Like if it gets to the point where I have to pay to roll my call to move it up, I'll just close the position. I recall Liz was a, a fan of the wheel. We had a long talk about the wheel, I believe. The wheel. When she was on yeah. uh, many different names. You guys call it the wheel of fortune. We called it uh, the wheel of fun, wheel of death, all kinds of fun. Triple income strategy, one of our host calls, which I hate, but he loves it. So it has many different I, names, the wheel. <laughs> and some people, you know, some people like to hold their stock. They like to get their dividends and uh, they don't want the tax repercussions of selling the stock. So I get it. There are plenty of people who have stock. They have their sell their calls against it. And if, I, if you're already in that, you don't want to sell it. Sure. Keep selling calls against it. Uh, Mr. Dan, sir, same question for you from our buddy here, JJL. Uh, you were obviously on the pro covered call side, so I'm going to assume you're you're also okay with selling puts in this environment. Or what do you have to say here for our buddy who wants to know should he be selling puts right now? Yeah, um, I I am okay selling puts selectively, of course. And if you recall, uh, Matt, who was on the anti covered call side. He did just kind of slip in there that he did a back test, which was selling at the money puts. Wait, how did it go? Selling at the money calls against a stock you own. And if you get assigned and lose the stock, then you sell a 
30 Delta put or something. Uh, he had a put strategy that he said, uh, a put selling strategy that he said was outperforming the market. I forgot exactly uh, what it was. I, I thought it had something to do with it. I didn't hear it because he was too busy hurling invective at you the entire time, in that intense <laughs> debate. I was just trying to hold him back virtually, of course. So, yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's a challenging. I mean, in in general, in a lot of ways, it's a challenging environment for covered calls and cash cured puts. But like Jenny pointed out, like, you know, if you pick your spots and you do it on the right products, you do it on the ones that, uh, you know, maybe are not at an all time high and that maybe do have a little bit of overpriced volatility to it. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not ruling out uh, covered calls and cash cured puts. All right, that music means we're coming up against to here. Let's get a little bit of listener love more on the way out. We have a, I was just joking about this. Looks like our pro members agree. We have one of our pro members, Age Adele Aquarius, listen and saying, uh, after all this talk of zebras and jade lizards, he says, pretty soon I'll need a degree in zoology to trade options. So there you go. <laughs> there you go, Jenny. You're luring all of our listeners to the dark side of anthropomorphic <laughs> option spreads. So <laughs> there we go. Uh, we got a little bit more listener love here. It comes from, I like this handle, BTC Vix. Even though that wasn't always his handle, he wrote in uh, about a month and change ago. He said, uh, Mark, when, when can I get an OG follow from you for being the first person to talk about Bitcoin futures and options back in the 2013 mailbag section? He said he wrote in as Bitcoin Bravo then. And yes, I vaguely recall that. 2013, you were definitely ahead of the game. Uh, so yeah, you got you get a follow for that. We don't follow many people out there because a lot of noise on Twitter, obviously. But you know what, Mister uh, BTC Vix, aka Bitcoin Bravo, for being so well timed on the crypto questions front, being ahead of the game, you get a follow out there. He was excited. He wrote in saying, "I finally followed by Ad Options, a true legend in the space." And boy, did he know how to choose the right handle back in 2007. Yeah, we had a little bit of good fortune on the Twitter side. If truth be told, I was just lazy. I didn't want to write Options Insider every time. So I just grabbed Ad Options. If I knew how much of a, of a land grab Twitter would become, I would have grabbed everything. I would have grabbed CME. I would have grabbed NASDAQ. I would have grabbed Schwab. I would have been the biggest Twitter squatter on the planet, but I was just being lazy. It turned out to work out. We have a pretty fun handle over there at Options, and we're happy to follow our listeners who've been listening for a long time, sending in so many great questions. And obviously, we're quite ahead of the curve. Congratulations to you there, uh, Bitcoin Vix. But that's going to do it for this episode. Jenny, great job in the guest cheer. Before we go, if there's any other thoughts you want to leave our audience with, now is the time. The floor is yours. Uh, I will say uh, one of my favorite things to do, and it, does, it violates some of our rules that we have over at Tasty, but um, I do like finding products that, I, that I, I'm interested in or wouldn't mind owning and just selling weekly puts, weekly puts until, uh, until then you get put the stock and then, and then turn it into your covered call. Uh, so that, that was, that did well for me last year and I am doing that in a handful of products this year. So that's my trading tip of the day. There we go. And if people want to check you out at your day job, where should they go? What should they do? I am on live every Monday through Friday, 10 to 11 central time at uh, tastylive.com. Tastylive.com, it's free and uh, it's fun. We have a nice community of people. I'm also on the road. Uh, we're on tour this year. I'm going to be in Houston in a few weeks. So you can check our tour out at uh, tastylive.com forward slash events. And uh, we're going to be all over the place this year. There you go. Check them out on tour. And Dan, if they want to go on tour all the way to the Southern Options Mecca of Frankfurt, what can they find <laughs> when they get there, sir? Uh, yeah, you'll find MTM World Headquarters here in Frankfurt. Um, and But I'll tell you what, you don't have to make the trek all the way here. You can find us on the interwebs. Just go to markettaker.com and, um, and join us. Click the Join Free button. We've got some free classes and such. You can join our, cla uh, our chat room for free, and we'd love to hear from you. It is funny. All the Frankfurt invading uh, options boot camp this week. It truly is the Southern Options Mecca. And there's a chance we all cross paths on the SIBO back in the How weird. The options world, very incestuous at the end of the day. That is going to do it for us on options boot camp. Also going to do it for us on the network today. Back again tomorrow, listeners, with your double dose of the option block with our friends over there at SIBO and the Flowmaster joining us for a lot of great uh, data and analysis and what's trading. Then after that, 
for a whole bunch of futures options with our friends over there at CME this week in futures options. So stay tuned for that. Friday, of course, back to talk a whole bunch of vol on volatility views. Who will be our guest? Got to tune in to find out. It's been a great guest roster already, and the year's just getting started. And then after that, exclusively for our pro folks, we come back for a whole bunch of options oddities. We get weird. We get wild. We uncover some crazy trades out there. So check that out. If you want to check that out for yourselves, only one place to go, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is a place to get access to all that fun and a whole bunch more. Then we're back again next week, all the way through to next Education Wednesday, another episode of Options Bootcamp. Stay safe out there, everybody. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>